waving at me frantically. I'm going to explain that things are going to be a smidge different this morning because we don't have our usual theme music. So the guys at the back are going to count me in when we go live on YouTube. There will be no theme music and we'll just start. To our service here this morning at Basingstoke Baptist Church. A very warm welcome to you all and particularly if it's your first time here. Uh, thank you for joining us. After the service there will be refreshments which will be served out uh, in the lobby. Uh, I need briefly to explain mm. that we have a number of people not here this week. On the schedule uh, Sue is doing the welcome. Uh, her mother is here. I have been mistaken for Sue's mother before. Um, so we, we miss Sue. Um, Sister. It was mother, wasn't it, Rog? Oh, yeah. you, you were there. It was, a, it was mother. They thought I was Sue's mother. Um, so for everybody who's watching at home, hello, and thank you for joining us online. Um, I'm very pleased this morning that we can welcome David Grant back as our guest speaker. Welcome, David. Uh, David wears a number of hats at the moment, uh, by profession at the moment, he's a kind of DIY specialist and handyman, so if you need anything doing around the house, he might be your man. Um, in church circles, he's administrator and does lots to do with one church, Basingstoke, our ecumenical group that, that knits us all together in the town. And David is also very actively involved with street pastors and the amazing work that they do late at night and early in the morning on the streets of Basingstoke. So welcome, David, and uh, bless you, and we look forward to hearing what the Lord will bring to us through you this morning. Uh, also, welcome back to Josh and Floss. Hi. <laughs> uh, they're going to lead our worship this morning. But before they kick off our music, I'd like to just share a few words from Psalm 96. These are the words that Sue has chosen to open our service. So Psalm 96, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but our Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Thank you, guys. Amen. Shall we stand if you're able and willing as we begin our time of song worship together? And maybe let's just close our eyes for a second. Let's shut out any distraction, hone in on him, the King of Kings. Let's look to Jesus. If you don't know him this morning, there's no better time to know him now. So I'd encourage you to just invite him. You don't have to say anything out loud. He hears your thoughts. Just say, Lord Jesus, would you show yourself to me today? And to us who know him already, let's just focus in on him who is so worthy. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he glorious? Isn't he beautiful? Lord Jesus, we welcome you into this space today. We acknowledge your presence already in this room. 
We welcome you to come and have your way among us. By your spirit, God, come and have your way among us. We make space in our hearts, in our calendar this morning, in our minds. Would you help us to shelve the things that might distract us from worshipping you this morning? And stir in us a spirit of worship as we come before your throne today. We bring you praise, we bring you adoration. You are the worthy one. We recognize you, our faithful friend, our ever-present help. The mighty one in battle, you've never lost a battle. And you're on our side this morning. We worship you, King Jesus.
if faith can move. If faith can move the mountains, let the mountains move. We come with expectation, waiting here for you. You're the Lord. You're the Lord of all creation. And still you know my heart. The author of salvation. You loved us from the start. We're waiting here for you. Hosanna in the high 
Hosanna in Hosanna in the high Hosanna in the in prayer and we're going to start with a prayer for Ukraine from the Baptist Union God of all peoples and nations who created all things alive and breathing united and whole show us the way of peace that is your overwhelming presence we hold before you the peoples of Ukraine and Russia every child and every adult we long for the time when weapons of war are beaten into plowshares, when nations no longer lift up sword against nation. We cry out to you for peace. Protect those who only desire and deserve to live in security and safety. Comfort those who fear for their lives and the lives of their loved ones. Be with those who are bereaved. Change the hearts of those set on violence and aggression and fill leaders with the wisdom that leads to peace. Kindle again in us a love of our neighbor and a passion for justice to prevail and a renewed recognition that we all play a part in peace. Creator of all, hear our prayer and bring us peace. Make us whole. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you with all praise and honor. Today we glory in your presence, great Father. We wonder and gaze upon the great works your hands have made. Your splendor surrounds us every day. Thank you, Father, that you loved, so loved the world that you sent your only Son to die for our sins and to save us. You raised him from the dead to be with you at your right hand. You have also raised us and called us to be your own, bringing us into your marvelous light. Continue to guide and direct our steps each and every day. Heavenly Father, this morning is all about you. Please help us worship you with an undistracted heart. You know how the mind wanders to the upcoming work week, present worries, thoughts of others, and other things. Help us put those thoughts away and focus on you and your glory. We ask that our minds be still for honoring you. Help us, Lord, open our eyes to what you want us to see and hear instead of going off for our own agenda. Lead us in building others up with the gifts and opportunities you have given us. Guide our leadership also in faithfully shepherding the flock here in Brighton Hill and beyond, spreading your word, making Jesus known now more than ever. Deepen our faith and joy in the glories of your gospel. Heavenly Father, would you remind us now of the ways in which we have sinned in thought, in word, in deed, intentionally or unintentionally. Father, we take a moment to confess our sins before you now. Forgive us for the times we have worked so hard to be self-sufficient, forgetting our need <coughs> for you and living independently of your spirit. Forgive us for letting fear and worry control our minds and for allowing pride and selfishness to wreak havoc over our lives. Forgive us for not following your ways and for living distance from your presence. Father of grace, thank you that you forgave us through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, that our sins are forgiven when we confess before you. 
Help us to understand that your ways are far greater than our ways and your thoughts far deeper than ours. Thank you that your grace is renewed every single day. You are close to the brokenhearted. You hear our prayers and know our hearts. Thank you for your daily powerful presence in our lives so that we can be assured no matter what we're facing that your heart is towards us. Your eyes are over us and your ears are open to our prayers. Thank you for surrounding us with favor as a shield and we are safe in your care. We give you praise and honor for your ways are righteous and true. We give thanks for our needs, that our needs are supplied and we are grateful for all you provide. You are almighty and worthy and we are so very honored that we serve a God of abundance. Out of your abundance, we ask that you bless us. Jehovah Jireh, our provider, go ahead of us this week. Multiply our every work so that our cup will run over in this coming week. Let the springs of living water flow through us so that we may also be a blessing to others. Finally, we pray, Father, for your fresh anointing and wisdom as David leads us in imparting your message to us and leading in the communion. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elizabeth. David, I invite you. We're going to take some time to take communion together. Saul had offered a burnt offering that Samuel should have done. He should have waited for Samuel. You've done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You've not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you've not kept the Lord's command. Saul didn't learn from that. He went on and offered further sacrifices and he was told to destroy the Amalekites and he, he only did part of what God said because he kept some animals back and offered them as a sacrifice, um, disobeying what God had said. And so God left, Samuel, left Saul. But David, well, he was a pretty nasty character. Well, in some respects, he committed murder and he took someone else's wife. Um, and yet, God said about David, David was a man after God's own heart. David, when he sinned, he recognised that he had sinned. He came humbly before God and asked God for mercy. He recognised he wasn't worthy of receiving mercy, but he received it. 
So as we come to communion this morning, as we share this bread and this, this wine together, we remember Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross. And it's good that during our prayers we confess our sins to the Lord. But, you know, you don't come to this table to receive communion because you are perfect. That should be a relief to all of us. <laughs> yeah. We don't come to the table because we're perfect. We become because we are unworthy. And it's in that state of unworthiness that we come to receive the forgiveness that Jesus offers us through his death and through his resurrection. And so as we come this morning and celebrate this, this act of sacrifice that Jesus undertook on our behalf, let's do so in an attitude of humility, recognising that we are not worthy of ourselves, but because of what Jesus has done, he considers us to be worthy before God because we have the righteousness that Christ gives to us. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, wrote these words. <clears throat> he said... For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And said, this is my body. Which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, as we come together this morning, as we partake in this meal that Jesus instituted on the night before he was crucified, as we eat this bread and remember his body, which was beaten and broken and battered and nailed to a cross. As we drink this wine and remember his blood, which was shed for us so that we could receive the forgiveness of sins. We come with humble hearts. We come knowing that you know the thoughts of our hearts and recognise that we're not worthy of any favour from you. But in our unworthiness... We humbly receive what Jesus offers us, his grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness. And as we eat this bread and drink this wine, we celebrate again the fact that we don't need to come cowering to you, but we can stand before you in the righteousness that Jesus has placed upon us. We give you glory, we give you honour, we give you praise, and we thank you for these simple elements of bread and wine which remind us of this wonderful truth, this wonderful act that you've done for us your glorious sake. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to ask the, the stewards to share out the bread and the wine. Um, if you uh, are not um, at a point where you feel you're able to take the bread and the wine this morning, there are some grapes on the table here at the front, and I understand particularly some of the children might want to come and have one of the grapes. So let's receive the bread and the wine together and do so with thankful hearts.
this in our hearts for the mercy and grace which Jesus has given us. Thank you, Lord.
going to sing another worship song, and I think during this, the children will be going out to their groups. So we stand together as we continue. We're going to sing a, sing a song called Worthy. And it just speaks of uh, some of that narrative, some of the story of what we've just uh, experienced and been part of in communion. And the worthiness of Jesus. Oh, 
ourselves in that place now for recognizing you are worthy of all that we have, all that we bring. You're worthy of every moment of our lives. You're worthy of us considering you in every thought, in every action that we do. Our wonderful Savior, we thank you. We thank you for the blood you shed for us for the freedom that we live in because of what you did for us on the cross. And Lord, we recognize this morning that the only way to repay that is to give ourselves to you, one who is worthy of all that we are. Sing that chorus one more time. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve. to your word now, Lord. We open our ears to hear you in a new way, to hear you more clearly. We pray, Lord, help us open our eyes to see you afresh this morning. We pray for Dave as well as he brings your word, Lord, that you would speak through him. Give him revelation and clarity of who you are, even as he speaks to us this morning. We say we're here for you, Lord. We're here for no one else but you. Help us to see you afresh today. Amen. Great. Thank you. Um, just before I get into the, the message proper, I um, just want to take a, a couple of moments to, to share a few things with you. Um, it was, in my introduction, it was mentioned that I do some work for One Church Basingstoke, and um, part of my responsibility is for something we're calling Together for Basingstoke, which is an initiative where we're trying to understand better how as churches and ministries in the town, we can coordinate our work together and also connect in with the civic authorities. Um, and so this, this coming week, I'd, I'd ask you to pray on Wednesday when we have a meeting, um, we have breakfast with the, with the mayor and the, the council leader, Maria Miller's coming, um, 
people like that from the, from the civic authorities of our town are coming to have a prayer breakfast with church leaders and other invited people. And it'd be an opportunity for us to think together about how um, we can work together to make Basingstoke a better place. And, and I fervently believe that Basingstoke will be a better place when God's people are united in praying and working for Basingstoke to be a better place. That's another sermon for another day. I could, I could go off on that. But uh, do please pray for that. But it's, it's also encouraging to see how the church and the people within the church are being recognised for the things they do. And so um, last Thursday evening, um, I went to a, a wonderful occasion at the Haymarket Theatre um, where there were a, the theatre was packed with nominees and their families and friends uh, for the Destination Basingstoke, a place to be proud of awards. Uh, some of you may have heard of this. Um, and Penny's not here. She's gone out. <laughs> um, so, do you, do you want to bring Penny in? Is that possible? <laughs> um, so, um, there were, there were a number of awards that people were up for, but there was uh, one particular set of awards, which was volunteers. Um, and there was an individual volunteer award, and there was a group volunteer award. Um, and I, I think it'd just be good, he's just coming through the door now, because um, Basingstoke Street Pastors won this award, which I brought with me, for the volunteers. They're the, the 25 or so um, current street pastors. Over the years, there's probably been over 100 street pastors. They're the ones that got, I, got, I went up to collect it. I've only been doing street passes for a few years. I went up to collect the award on behalf of dozens of people who've served faithfully over 15 years for street passes. But I was also so excited to see that Penny was nominated for the volunteer award for the work she's been doing for Community Food Link. So let's give Penny a round of applause. Her award looks exactly the same as this, but it's got her name on. <laughs> Thank you, Penny. Good. I hope you'll forgive me for little self-indulgence there, but uh, I think it was good to do. This morning's message I'm calling, What's Your Story? And we're going to be looking in John's Gospel at John chapter 9. Um, and it's quite a long passage, um, but I'm going to show some pictures on the screen as I read through the story, which hopefully um, will enable you to sort of focus on the story and, in, and get into the story a little bit more. So did that. Oh, I need to do here as well. Now, Jesus, as Jesus was passing by, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who committed the sin that caused him to be born blind? This man or his parents? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but he was born blind so that the acts of God may be revealed through him and through what happens to him. We must perform the deeds of the one who sent me as long as it is daytime. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, Jesus spat on the ground and made some mud with the saliva. He speared the, smeared the mud on the blind man's eyes and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So the blind man went away and washed and came back seeing. Then the neighbours and the people who had seen him previously as a beggar began saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some people said, this is the man. While others said, no, but he looks like him. The man himself kept insisting, I am the one. So they asked him, how then were you made to see? He replied, the man called Jesus made mud, smeared it on my eyes, and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and was able to see. They said to him, where is that man? He replied, I don't know. They brought the man who used to be blind to the Pharisees. Now the day on which Jesus made the mud and caused him to see was the Sabbath. So the Pharisees asked him again how he'd gained his sight. He replied, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and now I am able to see. Then some of the Pharisees began to say, this man is not from God because he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, 
How can a man who is a sinner perform such miraculous signs? Thus there was division among them. So again they asked the man who used to be blind, What do you say about him since he caused you to see? He is a prophet, the man replied. Now the, Jewish, now the Jewish religious leaders refused to believe that the blind man Jesus had healed had really been blind until they summoned his parents. They asked, is this your son whom you say was born blind? Then how does he see? So his parents replied, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how he is now able to see, nor do we know who caused him to see. Ask him. He is a mature adult, he will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jewish religious leaders. For the Jewish leaders had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he is a mature adult, ask him. Then they summoned the man who used to be blind a second time and said to him, Promise before God to tell the truth. We know that this man Jesus is a sinner. He replied, I do not know whether Jesus is a sinner. I do know one thing, that although I was blind, now I can see. Then they said to him, What did Jesus do to you? How did he cause you to see? He answered, I told you already and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You people don't want to become his disciples too, do you? They heaped insults on him, saying, You are his disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. We do not even know where this man Jesus comes from. The man replied, That is a remarkable thing, that you don't know where Jesus comes from, and yet he calls me to see. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. But if anyone is devout and does his will, God listens to him. Never before has anyone heard of someone causing a man born blind to see. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They replied, you were born completely in sinfulness, and yet you presume to teach us? So they threw him out of the synagogue. Jesus heard that they'd thrown him out of the synagogue, so he found the man and said to him, do you believe in the Son of Man? The man replied, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus told him, You have seen him. He is the one speaking with you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that those who do not see may gain their sight, and the ones who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and asked him, we're not blind too, are we? Jesus replied, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now because you claim you can see, your guilt remains. It's a powerful story, isn't it? And it, 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 it clearly um, develops as it's going along and there's so many things to, to draw out of it um, but I just want to highlight a few things from the passage this morning I think the first and this is not my main point but I think it is an important one for us to take note of the man's blindness was not the result of anyone's sin the the Jewish religious leaders and the Pharisees believed that the man born blind it was a consequence either of his own sin though I don't quite know how they worked that out since he was born blind and hadn't had a chance to sin before he was born. Um, or it was the consequence of his parents' sin. And that was a common belief at that time, was that blindness, sickness, disability, um, all these kind of things were a judgment from God upon an individual as a result of their sin. And it's easy for us to perhaps at this distance sort of say, well, how, how crazy is that idea? But how often do you hear people when they're going through difficulties Maybe they're, they're sick and in hospital, or there's a, there's a trauma in their life of some nature. And they will say, what have I done to deserve this? There's somehow kind of innately in us is this idea that if bad things happen to us, 
It must be because of bad things that we've done and that in some way we deserve some punishment for what we've done. Well, Jesus was very clear. He, he said quite clearly that this man's blindness was not the result of his sin. And I want to say to you this morning, if you're going through difficulties in your life and there are, there are challenges and illnesses or disabilities or problems you're facing, those are not necessarily the result of sin. Now, there are some sins which do bring consequences. Um, that there, are, there are some sins where just, the, the act actually leads to, to, to perhaps to an illness. Um, I'm thinking, for example, perhaps of sexual immorality, which could lead to venereal disease or something like that. There is a, a consequence there of the sin, but it's not a judgment. It's just a natural consequence of that's the way nature works. But people who, who believe that they are not... Um, being healed, that they're, they're facing difficulties in their life. It's not because of your sin that you're not being healed. It's not because of your sin that you face these challenges. What Jesus said was that this was an opportunity to glorify God. Now, this is difficult, isn't it? Because it's Jesus saying here, the man was born blind so that God could get the glory. That, that kind of, God sounds like a monster if that's the case. Now, I don't think that's what Jesus was saying. I think Jesus was saying that the man was born blind because that's just part of the fallen nature of humanity. Some of us um, face ill health and, and are born with disabilities and, and challenges like that. Others seem to be, go through life smoothly without too much trouble at all. That's just the, the nature of humanity. Humanity has fallen. The world we live in has fallen. And people do get sick and people do have disabilities and people do die and, and all these things happen. Jesus wasn't saying that those happen to bring glory to God. But what he was saying was that when those things happen, there is here an opportunity for God to be glorified. And for this particular man, Jesus' plan was he was going to heal a man of his blindness. And by doing that, was going to bring glory to himself and glory to the Father. He was born blind so the acts of God may be revealed through what happens to him. And then we see what Jesus does. And it's bizarre, isn't it? Jesus stoops to the ground and picks up some dust from the ground and he spits on it and he moulds in his hand to make some mud and then he plasters the man's eyes with this mud and then tells him to go to the pool of Siloam to wash that off. And in his obedience, the man is then healed. Some years ago, uh, when I first started leading the church in Hook, um, I was challenged because there were a number of people in our congregation who hadn't experienced healing but been living with um, sickness and disease for, for a long time. Um, and, I, and, I'd, and, I'd, and I'd heard and I'd experienced a certain amount of praying for people and seeing them healed, but it didn't happen every time I prayed for someone to get healed. Sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. So I decided that what I would do is I would read through the New Testament, uh, particularly the Gospels, with the specific aim of focusing and thinking about and reflecting upon the healings of Jesus. And in doing so, what I wanted to do was to come up with a formula that meant that I would know exactly how Jesus did it, and so that every time I prayed for someone to get healed, they would get healed. It probably won't surprise you to discover that I was, in part, unsuccessful in that. I was unsuccessful because I found that there isn't just one way that Jesus heals. Sometimes Jesus spat on, on mud and made a, a, a paste to put on someone's face. Sometimes he just spoke a word. Sometimes he wasn't even present when the person was healed. There are so many different ways that Jesus heal people, we can't come up with one formula that will always work. There was a method that Jesus used on this occasion, not a pattern that we should follow. And so, um, strange though it was, that was the right method for Jesus to use on that occasion. And I think we need to be careful in our thinking and reflecting about praying for people to be healed, of being too prescriptive and too dogmatic over this is what we must do in order to see someone receive a healing. So I do believe God heals, and I, and I love to pray for God to heal people, but I'm expecting each story and each account to be different.
And after the man was healed, there was surprise. There were people who um, didn't understand what had, had happened, and they were, in fact, I think I've probably gone ahead of a slide. Let's go to the next slide first. Um, there were lots of different reactions to the man being healed. There, there were people who were just surprised and sort of asking the question, isn't that the man who was blind, who used to beg? How is it he now sees? And other, other people wanted to come up with explanations. Now, it isn't a man, it's his, it's his identical twin. It doesn't say that word in the Bible, it's just someone who looks like him, but that's the only logical explanation, isn't it? If he looks exactly like him, it must be an identical twin. There were people who denied it. There were people who opposed it. And, it, and even the point of persecution, because um, the Jewish religious leaders had said that people who uh, decided to become followers of Jesus would be kicked out of the, the synagogue. And that would have been, meant they became outcasts in their community, in their society. And such was the fear of the man's parents, that when the parents were asked what had happened, they just agreed he was the man who was blind, but weren't going to give any kind of explanation for how the man had received his sight. But several times during this passage, the man tells his story. He tells everybody that a man called Jesus made mud, smeared it on my eyes, and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and was able to see. And if you track through the story, I, I think I make it about four times, but it, it may be, depending how you, you read the story, it may be even you could say it's five times. The man gives testimony to what God has done in his life. And really this is the main thing I want to, to focus on this morning, I want for you to take away, is the power of the man's story. There was a lot the man didn't know. In verse 12, he, he, he doesn't know where Jesus is. They say, where is this man who, who healed your sight? He doesn't know. He doesn't know where Jesus is. He, he didn't even know what Jesus looked like later in the story when he meets Jesus. But what he could say was, this is what I do know. I was blind. Jesus put mud on my eyes and told me to go and wash. And now I can see. When they ask him, well, who do you think he is? He, he doesn't really have much more of an answer than to say he must be some kind of a prophet. The, the, the blind man knew enough to know that it wasn't something that anybody could do. It wasn't something that was ordinary for someone to, to be able to heal his sight. Therefore, Jesus must be something out of the ordinary. And the language, the only language he could come up to describe who Jesus must have been was that Jesus was a prophet. They even tried to um, manipulate his answer. Um, and they, they, they say, give glory to God by telling the truth. They say, we know this man is a sinner. And, and the, the man replies, well, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But what I do know is I was blind, but now I was see. But now I can see. And so even though at times he was asked questions that he couldn't give the answer to, he would come back and tell people what Jesus has done in his life. And this is the application for us, because in this room, there are people who have been followers of Jesus for many years, for a few years. There are some of you would uh, maybe have done lots of reading and lots of study. Maybe some of you have even been to Bible college and, and got degrees and qualifications in what the scriptures mean and how to interpret them. There are others of you who maybe, frankly, find it quite hard to read the Bible and to understand what it, it says. And so when it comes to answering difficult questions that people might throw at you about faith and religion and how the world was made and, and who Jesus is and who God is, and you may find at times that there are, you, you think, I, I don't know how to answer this question. We can be like this man who says, well, I don't know how the world is made, but what I do know is Jesus has done this in my life. We can tell our story. And no one can ever take that away from you. People might try and, and twist it and manipulate it. But at the end of the day, your story, your experience of Jesus, whether it's a long time ago or whether it's recent, is yours. It's unique. 
It's individual and it's powerful. And it's a story that will have an impact in people's lives. This man, though he didn't understand and couldn't give deep theological understanding of, of what had happened, what he did know was that God had listened to Jesus and that it was God's power that enabled his sight to be restored. There was another man in, in the Bible, the man who was living um, in the regions of the, of the Gerizines and he was um, demonized by a demon that called himself Legion, meaning that there were many demons within him. And when Jesus delivered him from, those, from that evil, he asked to go with Jesus. Jesus said, no, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. And then the man went around the whole region telling others what Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. You can read that story in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's in all three of those Gospels. And it's just another illustration of where the power of Jesus comes into someone's life, brings complete transformation, brings restoration and healing and wholeness, and Jesus' instruction to that man and his instruction to us is go and tell your family and friends what I've done for you, what difference Jesus made in your life. And as the story unfolds, Jesus goes back and searches out the outcast man. The man born blind has been isolated from his community, thrown out of the synagogue and, and made... Um, unacceptable in the, in the village where he lived. And Jesus goes and finds him. And when he finds him, he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And it's clear, the man doesn't recognize Jesus because he's never seen him. So he says, well, who is he? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you've now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And at that point, the man falls and worships Jesus. No longer is he considering Jesus to be a prophet, but he recognizes Jesus for who he is, the Son of God, the God-man, the one who is worthy of our worship and our honor and praise, and he becomes a follower of Jesus. And Jesus talks then a little bit about his purpose, why he's come to the world. He, he's come to the world to bring judgment. He's come to the world to, to, to make a difference between those who have spiritual sight and recognize who he is and those who are spiritually blind and refuse to acknowledge that he is the saviour of the world. He is the Christ. He is our Messiah. So, let's think about my story. Think about your story. When I was a teenager and I was asked to share my story about Jesus in my life, I, I would, I'd say something like this, that uh, I was um, living a life of wild, reckless sin and I was into drugs and sex and rock and roll and fast cars. And then when I turned three, I gave my heart to Jesus. <laughs> yeah. um, and clearly what I said previously couldn't have been happening because three-year-olds aren't doing all of those things. Three-year-olds can be naughty, but they're not doing those things. Um, why did I do that? I was kind of embarrassed. I was embarrassed that I was brought up in a Christian home, and, and from a, the, the very earliest age, I, I prayed to Jesus, and I read my Bible, and I trusted Jesus and believed in him. And as my life develops, I can think of when I was seven, and I went to Ashburnham Place, and I, I gave my heart to Jesus. Again, I used to be embarrassed about this. I, I went to a, a children's group called, uh, called Fish Club, um, and we met in the orangery, and on one day, um, the, the teachers were talking about the passage in the Bible which says that um, all the angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner repents. And this impacted me, and, I, and I, I said to the teacher, I want to give my heart to Jesus, forgetting I'd done it when I was three. And so the, we made an arrangement, I went back in the afternoon and sat under a huge oak tree in the sunshine and gave my heart to Jesus. because. Why? Because I wanted the angels to have a party. That's how seven-year-olds think. And I used to be really embarrassed about that. Actually, it's quite a good reason to become a follower of Jesus because it wasn't to save my skin, it was actually to give glory to God. Um, so in I, it, it hindsight, I don't think it was a very bad reason, but I, I was embarrassed as a teenager because I, my story seemed really unimpressive. I, I couldn't 
talk about a big transformation that happened in my life, like the, the fantastic testimonies they hear of, of thieves who get saved and murderers who get saved and, and all these kind of things. But as time has come by, and I've shared different aspects of what God has done in my life with other individuals, I've come to learn that actually it's good for me to own my story. And it may not be a rags to riches. It may not be a, a life of terrible sinfulness um, and drugs and sex and rock and roll and then turning to Christ. That there are people for whom that is their story, and that's great. But my story of being brought up in a Christian home and, and my understanding and my faith growing at different key stages as I, I developed as a human being, sort of in line with that, that's my story and that has been a blessing for others. And so this morning I want to encourage you that whatever your story is, your story may be a very dramatic story. Your story may, you may feel, is actually really quite unimpressive, but that's not the point. The point is, it is your story and you can talk about the difference that Jesus made in your life, however big or great that might seem to others. And your story will be a blessing for other people. So, your story is your story. Your story is unique. Your story is powerful. No one can take your story from you because it is your story of what Jesus has done in your life. And the key thing is, in your story, your story begins and ends with Jesus. This man kept going back and saying, Jesus did this. Jesus put mud on my eyes. Jesus gave me my sight back. I don't know the answer to all your difficult questions, but this is what Jesus has done for me. And I want to encourage you, as you go into this week, into the, the coming days, and you have opportunities to talk with people, be willing, be ready, be eager to share the story of what Jesus has done for you, even if you can't answer all their clever intellectual questions. And that leads me to my final question, really, is, have you got a story? I, I kind of, all the way through, made an assumption that everyone in this room does have a story of what Jesus has done in your life. But it, it may be this morning you're stand, sitting there thinking, well, Dave, it's all very well for you and for the people around me, but I don't have a story. It is possible to have been in church for, for many years and yet not have reached that point where actually you have recognize who Jesus really is, that you've received his offer of grace and forgiveness as we talked about and shared as we took communion together. And I want to encourage you, make today the day where you receive Jesus as your Lord and your Saviour, where you accept his offer of mercy for the sin in your life, and that you can start on that journey of having a story with Jesus. And this man's story was around a period of a few hours on that particular day. And he became a follower of Jesus and that story would have continued to unfold and unfold. And that should too be our experience, that um, our story is continuing to unfold as Jesus continues to make a difference in our lives. So if, like me, you've been a follower of Jesus for over 50 years, um, is your story still living and vibrant and up-to-date? Are you still experiencing the difference Jesus makes in your life today as well as you did 10, 15, 20, 40, 50 years ago when you first became a follower of Jesus? So what's your story? Have you got a story of Jesus in your life? Are you ready to share that story? Maybe, I, I don't know whether you have a small group meeting this week, um, connect group or something like that. Perhaps one of the things you could do when you gather together with other people this week is just to talk about your stories and say, this is how I became a follower of Jesus and this is the difference of Jesus being made in my life because as we practice sharing it with other believers, it gives a little bit more confidence when we come to share it with those that we rub shoulders with in the workplace or down the street or in Tesco's or, where is it? Asda over there, isn't it? That's probably where you all go. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this 
really quite exciting story of the blind man who Jesus healed. We thank you that um, we can see in his interactions with those who would oppose him or those who were puzzled about what had happened that he was confident of one thing and that it was Jesus who made him well. And Father, I ask this morning that your Holy Spirit would come afresh on each of us and give us that confidence that even when we can't answer people's difficult questions about faith, we can stand on this one thing that Jesus has met with us and transformed our life, that he has made a difference in our life that cannot be taken away from us. And Father, for anyone here this morning who hasn't yet begun that story with Jesus, I pray that they would receive your forgiveness today and start on this exciting journey of being a disciple, being a follower of Jesus, and that all the glory might go to him. Amen. Should we stand as we sing this last song together? Thank you, Dave, for that powerful word that um, says whatever our story is, the most important bit is he who met us, who changed us, who encountered us, Jesus Christ, the living one, resurrected one, the only son of God, saviour, redeemer, priest and king. What a wonderful Jesus we know. We're just going to sing this last song and just seal that word in as we sing it. The, the chorus says, this is my story, this is my song, praising my saviour all the day long. And as we sing it, I pray that that word will just seal in our hearts. And maybe as we gather um, to share fellowship after the service, it will be a great way of responding to Dave's message this morning by asking one another for those stories of encounters with Jesus that we've each had. Beautiful Jesus. Let's sing blessed assurance together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. This is 
my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is. Oh, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. in response to our message this morning is we're just going to take a very simple refrain come Lord Jesus come and we just encourage you to take this opportunity to invite Jesus invite his story into what you're doing this week that this wouldn't just be a Sunday message but much like the guy who we've just been reading about and learning about in scripture that this would be a message that impacts our week just take this very simple refrain and maybe you just want to bring to mind some of the places you're going to be walking into some of the challenges you might be facing this week some of the things that you might be looking forward to some of the people you're going to be encountering in the next couple of days just encourage you to bring those people those places to mind now and we're just going to sing this little refrain as a, a prayer moment to invite Jesus into everything that we're going to be in this week, every conversation, every space that we find ourselves in. Let's pray this together. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus. You into our workplace, we say, Come, Lord Jesus, come, come, Lord Jesus, come. Just keep bringing those things to mind, those places. We pray, Come, Lord Jesus. So I'm going to uh, throw my husband into brief confusion for which I apologize. Uh, those of you who were in the hall have heard about a little bit, I think, about the uh, award for street pastors. But of course, the kids all missed it because um, we were out. And I think it's worth celebrating. So Mark, can you pop the picture up for me, please, if you can find it? We'll start with the one of David, if that's possible. Uh, so for those of us who were out in the back, uh, there was a big awards ceremony in town. And two of the people uh, in this building uh, won awards. Uh, our visiting speaker, David Grant, 
it was representing street pastors and collected award for the best volunteer group of the, the year. So let's... And our own Penny Dilly collected an award for the Volunteer of the Year for the work that she does with Community Food Bank. So congratulations, and I know both those people would acknowledge the huge amount of teamwork that goes in. And I've asked Jenny just to come up, and before we end our service, Jenny's going to lead us in prayer for the work of the street pastors and of Community Food Link. Thanks, Jenny. Let's pray together. Father God Almighty, we thank you so much for your great goodness to us and your many, many gifts and the many times you answer our prayers. Lord, we thank you for these groups, the Street Pastor Group that David has represented and the Community Food Link um, where Penny has received her award. Lord, we recognise that we often don't want recognition for things that we've done in service of you because we know, Lord, we'll get our reward in heaven. But Lord, we also recognise that when there is recognition, Lord, it brings glory to you. And so we thank you, Father, so much for the work of the street pastors that has gone on for so many years. Lord, helping people in the town, in the evenings, when they are perhaps distressed, giving them comfort, giving them practical help. And for the Community Food Link, Lord, where we are feeding people who are needy, people who need your support. Lord, in both these activities, we are being your hands and your feet serving those who need your love, who need your comfort. And so we pray for these two groups, Lord, that you will continue to bless them, to answer their prayers, to support them. And Lord, sometimes that work is hard work and the people there are getting weary. And so Lord, when they are weary and feeling fed up, Lord, we pray that you would sustain them. And that Lord, as these awards are broadcast, Lord, that it would be recognition for you, that it is service to you, that, Lord, this would be such an opportunity to witness, to tell a story about what you have done here in Basingstoke. Lord, may your story be broadcast, may your name be broadcast, and you glorified, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to serve you in the street pastors. Thank you for this opportunity to serve you in the Community Food Link, to have a story about how great you are. Lord, may you reign in our town. And we particularly pray for that meeting with the civic team on Wednesday with our church leaders, that Lord, you would give us more opportunities for recognition of how great you are. And may we step up, Lord, and serve you so that your name will be known. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jenny. So we take that message forward into the coming week. The message that our Father loves us, that he calls us to serve, and that he is with us. This is our story. This is our song. Praising my Saviour all the day long. Amen. Amen. Just a couple of notices there.